right. Hello, everybody. This is Joe Roof, formerly of Cal Football and now president of Big C Society. Together with us today are Robert Paler, the incoming executive director of the Big C Society, and our special guest, Rochelle Federico, or Mooch, as her teammates know her, <laughs> formerly of Cal Basketball, women's basketball. Uh, Rochelle also serves as the liaison director to women's basketball on the Big C Society Board of Directors, and is well on the way to becoming a producer at Pixar, the digital animation studio. Uh, for some sports context, here's a little background on Rochelle. She attended high school in Tucson, Arizona, where she was an all-state basketball and softball standout. She came to Cal in 2007, uh, played in 16 games in her freshman year and continued to play every year thereafter, serving as co-team captain in her senior year and scoring a team high 16 points versus Stanford along with earning Love all the Pac-10 honorable mention, uh, all academic Pac-10 honorable mention with a degree in media studies. And finally, in a quest to make Rochelle blush, which I like oh, to do yeah. at board meetings, I'd like to share that she's been a remarkably insightful director on our board with a knack to getting uh, for getting to the, the nub of things quickly, which uh, we really appreciate. Welcome, of Rochelle. Course. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> Uh, as we do today, we're, we're going to examine uh, Rochelle's professional journey so far and investigate whether her experience as a Cal athlete gives her an edge in her work. Uh, so let's just jump right in. Rochelle, can you um, can you tell me the story of how you came to be a software product manager at SunPower, which seems like it was like the first role where you were in a really significant position of influence and um, in your response, I'm hoping you can describe the steps that got you there, beginning with the day that you graduated Cal, including what was on your mind back then, <laughs> and then all the subsequent maneuvers and precursor jobs and networking and training and skill development and so forth that were required to ladder into that first PM role. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot to, to cover, so I'll try to be quick. But um, if you go back to the, the day of graduation, um, uh, Wow, what a feeling of um, happiness and sadness all at the same time. And I'm sure future graduates or graduates that have gone through it know exactly what I'm talking about, where your life is feels like it just ended and it feels like it also at the same time it's just beginning. And so I remember um, being terrified, quite frankly, of, of what in the world was I going to do. And I, I knew I loved animation and I knew I wanted to be at Pixar. But getting getting in there what is 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 super competitive and um, takes sometimes takes years of applying. So in the meantime, I was I said, okay, well, what can I do that is similar to producing and um, product management? It is essentially you're a producer of a software, so it, it, it's the same kind of managing budget, time, and people. So when I when I was leaving Cal, I, I applied to a bunch of um, film places and other places as well, as well and just had zero luck I literally did not get a call back like to the point where I almost thought I had to move back home and um, I remember being a little bit desperate and um, be getting in contact through Cal alumni actually um, in the solar company and at that time it was Sunrun and um, they said we're looking for entry level you know at administrators, contract signers, and, you know, pushing paper around in the back office. And I said, yes, like I'll take anything I can get. <laughs> and let me just tell you, I was so happy that that happened because who really knows what they want to do when they're 22? Like you might, you might know, you might be that small amount of people who, who are just so, this is exactly what I want to do. And I'm going to graduate. I'm going to do it. And who actually go into that career right away. So I was able to sit back at Sunrun and watch kind of um, every role and what they're, what what everybody was doing. And I was like, oh, do I like that? No, do I not like this? And that's kind of how product management came up. I had seen what they were doing. And I was like, hey, that's exactly what a producer does. And so through, a, a, you know, talking to the right people and opportunity that, that, that came up, I applied and was able to move into the product team. And... I want to make sure I'm I'm not missing any big things like you get this is this is kind of 
what you're looking for. So I want to make you're, sure. You're, yes, you're doing great. <laughs> and I, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions in a minute that uh, yeah. that, dr that drill into a couple of these subjects. So you're doing great. Move along. All right. So so um, once I got into product management, I knew at the same time I was still applying to Pixar um, every year. So that was still something that I knew I was going to get to at some point. But um, the opportunities in product were endless in solar at the time. I was at the first company that created the, the financing option for solar, which is Sunrun. And it was a startup and, and being scrappy and um, watching a company grow was, I, I can't, you can't put rough, like value to that, that type of experience. But anyway, so, so on, on product, um, just to be clear, are, can, I, can I make one interjection yeah. there? Yeah. What you're saying is when you go to a startup, you get to work long hours, long hours <laughs> for less money than most people yeah, uh, exactly. would, would agree to work for, but you get tons of experience and that's yeah. kind of the trade. That, that is, that is the trade and the, and the pitch is we'll pay you back in stock when we make it some point and, yeah. and hope that we sell this company and go public. Um, yeah. And especially for startups and kids right out of high school, they or right out of college. They loved it, right? It's you're yeah. hungry. You want work and they'll, they'll, they'll ride you. They'll take every answer. But when you're 22, 23, I, you know, it's, it, it, especially being an athlete. And this is something I'm, I do want to tie back is these long hours that people talk about or the work ethic of you're literally are putting everything you have into a startup or a company or your role that it's already ingrained in us, right? Like we, we breathe and die and whatever word you want to put live eats sports right that that's that's what drives us i wake up every remember wake up every morning and my day was all about what are we doing today as a team when's my practice when's my study hall yeah so we have all this structure we have the discipline so when it goes to when you go to the real world to me that never came up i was never like gosh i'm working too much or gosh you know the yeah. Whatever it may be, because I was so used to that. And it yeah. was almost like I had too much freedom. I was like, wait, we're done? Like, work's done? Is there, like, what's next? You know? And you have yeah, coworkers who are like, I just want to go home. I'm tired of being here. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So I can certainly empathize. I'm, I'm being a veteran of the entrepreneurial, you know, sort of software startup path. I think that's totally right. It's, yeah. it's sort of native to the athlete mindset. If you're not running uphill, you know, all day long and then, <laughs> you know, three more times on the weekend, something feels like it's wrong. Something feels weird. Yeah. So I have a question. Can you, can you describe the role of the product manager for our audience? Cause for some of our people, they're going to be wondering if, is this, is this something I want to angle toward before we move on to, to the producer role and yeah, also uh, con contrast if you can, like what makes a great PM and like a kind of a bad PM? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a, a P, if, if, if you, okay, let me take a step back. This is how I used to explain it. Anytime you go on a computer, whether that's your phone, your, your, your desktop, whatever it is, and you're interacting with something, your hands are touching something, your eyes are looking at something. There is a software product manager or owner behind everything you are experiencing. And Nothing I just say, happens. Nothing just happens. That button you click, and you're like, "Oh yeah, I'm going to the next page." That 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 the motion of going to the next page and what you see and the first thing you see was all decided by one person, with who does a lot of research and um, product design research, customer research, um, you name it, to make sure that your experience on this app, software, whatever it is, is seamless. And kind of gets you addicted so you keep coming back. So we'll use, use I like to, well, we'll use, try, can we use a regular app name to talk on? Like we'll talk about Facebook, for example. Like sure. when it first yeah. started, there was a product owner. There was somebody who had a group of engineers and had a bunch of stakeholders and research done to say, I think people want to do this. So what they do is they go out, they find the engineers your engineering team and you build a team together and you say, okay, we're going to build this software and here's how we're going to roll it out. Here's the, every updates we're going to have, because you all see updates on your phone. That's like update your app. Um, and, and so what, what makes a good product owner versus a bad one is essentially a good product owner knows your audience, right? They, they have gone out and they've done the research and they do testing with people all the time to say, well, what, what do people want and need, right? 
And then they're also able to explain that and break it down to their company and say, here's why we're going to do what we're going to do. Here's the stat, here's the statistics and the research to prove why we need to add this button or why we need to create a new web page altogether. And then the, what's the, the most difficult part, I think, is then motivating a team of engineers to actually build exactly what you want. Because that process is so iterative, you're constantly changing, you're constantly making tweaks to, to, to feel better. And you might have a team that would get annoyed at that, like, gosh, we just changed that, but we got to change it again. And how do you rally a group of people around this cause of we're going to make the best experience and, and here's why what you're doing is so important. So bad product managers, on the other hand, and I've seen my, my fair share of them will constantly make excuses for why something's not working, right? Like somebody will say, hey, we noticed that our stats are down. Why hasn't why haven't, why haven't we seen more people come to, to site B? And they'll say, oh, well, you name it, insert excuse. Because good product owners will notice that and they'll say, we got to fix this before it even becomes, before executives become aware of it, before anybody else comes there, because you know your website, you know your software inside and out. Like you should be constantly studying your, your um, analytics on that. So another, one other thing about a bad product manager is if, you don't want to have responsibility put on you, even when it's not your fault. It's probably not the role for you because as much as you own the success of this platform, you also own the failure, whether or not it's your fault. And I think that's one of the most difficult things for people in general is to admit when things don't go their way or life gets, you know, it, it, it's really easy to blame, blame, blame. And well, so, yeah, go ahead. I want to make sure I heard you right. So this, <clears throat> it sounds actually like there, there were a, a, like the the product manager sits right in the middle of a number of different constituents, <clears throat> and so there's the user audience, there's the engineering team you mentioned, mm -hmm. there's the executive team that you're going to be talking about how you're going to make money, how much it's going to cost, and so forth. Yep. Right. And for a lot of companies too, I, my understanding is you also have the design team, which is also the user experience design yeah. team is another yep. constituent. And, um, the, you know, what you just mentioned is true. Like it's, I think people equate the product manager role, you know, to sort of like being the CEO role of the product because it's such a consequential, uh, like position where you have better knowledge about your product across all these different functions than right. anyone else. And, yep. and, and, it, and you measure yourself against the success of the product. And so if the product doesn't do well, you know, life sucks for you. And if the product's <laughs> yeah. doing great and, you know, your users are happy, then that's like, you feel like you're doing great. Is that yep. more or less what? That was a great summary. That was like, <laughs> that was perfect. Yeah. It, you're the CEO of your product. And at some point it might feel like a dictatorship, but uh, you know, <laughs> comes with the territory. <laughs> I also think it's a particularly challenging and also interesting role. So for anybody who wants to be CEO someday, if, you know, being a product manager is actually an outstanding way to get going. Yeah. Uh, sometimes general managers of, uh, of, of a business uh, division have similar responsibilities. However, the product manager role, I think, is actually slightly better personally because you know, you have this this really sort of user facing and engineering yeah. facing and you know design facing uh you know kind of elements to the role you don't just get to be like the executive that says like no that's too expensive or whatever right you have to like make everybody happy and, and balance it all and like mm -hmm. that's the that's kind of what you know ceos do on, a, on an even larger scale across all the functional um yeah areas of a business. So like, uh, that sounds like really challenging and also really fun. Yeah. And, and if you, if you notice that you don't like your days being the same product management's for you, because I can tell you, I, I don't, I don't even remember being able to pick up on a pattern of what I was doing at times. It's so you were, you're so all over the place and having to make sure you're talking to all those people and appeasing them and whatnot. So it, it, there was definitely a rush that with sports that came with that, especially around go live dates so that, when you knew you were going to be launching or up, sending updates to the world that night before, that day before the prep and get, making sure, okay, we're all about to click launch. And what are all, what, did everybody test everything? Everybody's on a call together. Everybody's in a room together. We press play together. And that feeling is like, 
it, it was it's like the closest I've gotten to replicating being an athlete and like tip off happening. That like is so time. cool. So, yeah. Uh, also wanted to mention for anybody who's interested more about the product manager role, like uh, a good seminal piece to read is uh, Ben Horowitz's good product manager, bad product manager. And uh, yes, yeah, I've even read like, that. <laughs> it's like 15 years old, but it's still really good. He's hysterical. And mm-hmm. it's, it's also right to the point. So, okay. Now you mentioned at the outset of this, we all know that you're, you're now sort of an aspiring producer at Pixar. So you've made it into Pixar. Finally. <laughs> but I'm sensitive that you don't typically start out at Pixar at the top of the heap. So can you describe like the yeah. conversation that, you know, with your partner that like, I want to drop this verified hard won lucrative career as a software product manager <laughs> and join Pixar as a grunt production assistant. Yep. Oh, you just, yeah, there it is. Putting the salt over the wound again. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> let me tell you, um, I, 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 I always bring this back to sports and, and, and it's not because it's a podcast about this. Let me tell you this, this is, this is like fundamentally through and through. I owe my experience to Cal women's basketball and specifically Joanne Boyle, who's my head coach at the time, uh, if I could go back and tell them now, which I have, I have talked to Joanne of how in the moment when I wasn't playing a lot, I remember being angry, you know, even like, should I transfer? Do I need, like, I need to get out of here. Like I'm not playing because, you know, we all graduate as stars. And when you go to the next level, some of us continue being stars and some of us have to learn to be a role player. And so looking back, I couldn't have been more thankful to them for, Stay in the track and, and tell me, keep working harder, to, you know, why not? Because it taught me the art of, hum- I don't know if humility is the right word, but just putting me back down to earth, right? Like, I, I'm not a star anymore. My ego was hit. Like, oh, I was hurt. I was at the, you know, gosh, the, the bottom, right? The bottom of your college career when you don't start or you don't play a lot. Everybody's and, good. Exactly. And, um it's made me a better person moving forward. Like if, if I came into Cal and was a star and stayed a star the whole time and then went on to play pro and whatnot, I know I wouldn't have been able to take this risk that you talked about. I wouldn't have. I would have stayed in product management because I was at the top of the, of the game, making a lot of money and living the San Francisco you know, life and things were good. And, um, but when I finally, because I applied to Pixar, over and over and over again. When I finally made it, it was literally, it was going to be the, the least amount of money I had ever made, even starting as a contract, like contract work at, at Sunrun. Like it was, the, it's like you were restarting your career and I had just turned like 29 or 30. And I was just, I know I could do this. I know. And I talked to my wife about it and we, you know, she, we, she had said, we're going to be fine. Like, we're gonna, we'll create a budget. It's gonna, like, if anything, it's more of your ego. Like, are you going to be okay? And I was like, yes. Like, I know what this feels. I know what putting your time in and putting your work is. And so to me, to never cro- it never really crossed my mind of not doing it. And I, again, I have to go back to, to, to Joanne Boyle because she taught me that lesson. It's not about you. It's about the team. And for me, it's not about me. It's about the films now, right? So how do we make the films the best that they can be? So. Oh. Man, that is, I love yeah. this story so much. And it, just, <laughs> Start it, at the it, it, it really takes remarkable confidence to go from a, uh, a place where you were in a position of influence, which is what a lot of people are striving yeah. to be in, uh, to then, you know, climb down off that mountain, you know, back into the valley and start climbing back up a different mountain. But actually, yeah. the other thing that strikes me is it, it seems like you kind of always knew that you wanted to get onto the Pixar mountain. So that may have, I mean, it would have been hard no matter what, but that's at least, seems like you were really clear about that. And that is, uh, that's also rare. I mean, most people don't have the benefit of knowing exactly what they want. Exactly. And I I, I do always caveat my stories with that because um, I, 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 I have four younger sisters and they, they're all, they all have me to look up to and say, well, you went to Cal, you played basketball, and now you work at Pixar. Like, I don't I don't have all of that. I don't know what I want to do. And I do struggle with helping them find what what makes them tick. Because I think it's different for everybody. Um, so, yeah, I, I, 
I don't know, I guess maybe there, there is a little bit of competitiveness that goes into like wanting like a, a, a correlation to sports of I knew I wanted to play at the highest level that I could possibly play at. And so all the work that went into it was practice work. I know I want to get to big stars. So it was like yeah. um, knowing that that your drive is going to kind of take over at some point and want me to be the best. It just, this meant being the best meant kind of, you know, coming back down and going up. Again. It was, so. it was like the salary and influence thing, but you know, you're, yeah. you make this, it, there is an interesting point. These, it's not, you know, Pixar is, is a, is a tech shop. I mean, this is, it's digital yeah. animation. So you, and you, you did actually make the point earlier that the role of producer and product manager, you know, aren't so dissimilar. So since right. we're, we're now in talking about <clears throat> the uh, the role of product manager, uh, I guess you could actually, you can answer, answer both these questions, you yeah. know, maybe con- contrast with what makes a great producer and a bad producer, since we've already heard what a great PM and a bad PM sounds like. And then for, for both of those jobs, you know, for a product manager, and then as a, as a producer, you know, like, start at Tuesday, just give us a sense for both of those jobs, like what you did on Tuesday, like come to work, you know, don't leave anything out. Like, you know, <laughs> where, where did you sit in the organization? Who did you report to? You know, yeah. what, what kind of meetings were you in? What kind of software tools did you use? Were there any in- indispensable skills that made help you be good and so forth? Like, you know, all that little detail about what a day in the life is like. Yeah. Um, so I'll go to your first question, uh, which is what makes a good producer and a, and a bad producer. And the, the the one underlying thing I missed with the product manager is that you, you the biggest and most important aspect any producer or product manager can bring is relationship building. And anytime you're in a position where you have to tell people what to do, right? And that's that's what a product manager does and that's what a producer does is I, I am the person that makes the decisions and tells people to do it. And that's a really hard role. When you're always the person that has to tell people what to do, you get all types of responses from humans, right? Some people are like, oh, who are you to tell me to do something? Or somebody's and, like, and prioritizing too, right? So and not prioritizing, just, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's like so, not, not just like what are you doing today, but like what are you doing for the next month? For the next six months, yeah. So a good <laughs> producer is able to lead a team of a button and in animation our, our crews can get up to in the in like prime time where everybody's working on it close to 250 to 300 people so you are and you are the one deciding timeline budget and resources or, or people who's working on your film and um i think people who do that with grace and compassion tend to get the best out of their out of, out of their people it's just like a coach or a captain, right? It's, it's, how do you motivate? How it like that the core is, how do you motivate people to do what you want them to do? Because it's for, for your product or for your film. Um, and I've seen, I've seen when ego does get in the way or when power gets, takes over somebody that, especially in production film, film is, you, you all see celebrities, film is full of ego and the producer and director, if they fall into that and they get into this rut of, what I say goes and that's it. And this, you know, I've, I've been here for 20 years and I have so many Oscars because, you know, it, it, Academy Awards, it's just easy to say at, at Pixar. Um, can can it, I mention a theory? Bad. Sure. There's a, there's a theory I'm wondering about that that's emerging here for me, which is, you know, in product development, people always talk about how important empathy is in the sense that if you don't understand your user mm-hmm. and their needs, you know, underscore, I am not the user. Exactly. You're not going to make great products. Right. You're not going to make products that people actually want to use. And it mm-hmm. sounds like the producer role has some of that too. Like the, the, the empathy part of leadership where you are, you understand, you know, the, you know, what it feels like to walk in the shoes of all the people on your yep. team, you know, and how to, you know, what, what people's intrinsic motivations are, what their aspirations yep. are. Yep. And so forth, you know, I, uh, I've talked to Rob in the past, you know, this is sort of like, you know, an engine that you're, you're constructing, except for that the gears are human beings with all <laughs> yes. kinds of emotional yeah. complexity. Yeah. And like, so like, you know, is empathy as important as a, as a producer as it is as a product manager? 
Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And, and, and even, so that's like behind the camera empathy and then in front of the camera empathy, which is who are you making this movie for? And what message are you trying to get across? It's the same for product. Why am I making this and who's going to be using it? And what, what effect is it, like, am I going to have on their lives by them using the software? So it's very much hand in hand. I, and I said this in my interview too when I was first joining Pixar. I was like, I picked this career because I know that the skill sets match. I know that it's you know what what producers do. So there was a uh, you know, one of my last companies. We were working with Ogilvy on something, and they were talking us through like how they make commercials. And the one that they always point to is this man. He's standing at a museum, and he's looking at a picture with his like former wife was in the picture, and he's just sort of like gazing at it you know, with longing basically. And, you know, everybody cries and when they're watching, and then it just comes up Kodak, you know, and it's all, you know, it's like, it just, again, it's emotion, yeah. empathy, like understanding how people feel. It seems like it's so organic and important to the process of making a film. Yeah, very much so. And then like the producer, like you got to be like the most empathetic. Yeah. And especially because you're, you're, you're taking care of your director, which is, I think, that partnership between director and producer is unlike anything I've seen in the professional world. It, it, it borders, it borders a romantic relationship because of how intimately involved you two are in making decisions and the way that you fight with your producer, your director and the way that you make up and the way that you move forward in decisions and you can disagree, agree to disagree. It's very, it's, it's so intimate and okay, being so able to tell, manage that. Yeah. Tell ahead. us, tell us more about the director, you know, what, what role, how is their role different and how, let's talk more about that marriage. Yeah. That, I mean, that sounds very it's fascinating. It's fascinating. That's why you know, when you see a lot of um, films that you, you find directors that you love over the years, like Steven Spielberg or, you name it, right? And they always have, if you look at their credits and their films, they always have a few producers that are always on their films with them. Or you can see, oh, for about that decade, he was with X producer. You know, um, George Lucas was with Kathleen Kennedy for a really long time. You watch all those classic Lucasfilm films, you're going to see Kathleen Kennedy's name there. And that's because it's the amount of trust that has to be put between a producer and director. The director is in charge of all creative, like creative decisions, right? With help from the producer, the producer does have creative say, but they are the visionary. They're the ones that, you know, choose choose the, the, the writer and the, the set that you're in and the special effects. And then the producer has to partner with them and then implement everything that they're kind of asking for with your own flavor of how you want to get this done with the director. Keeping them tethered to the budget. Keeping them tethered to the budget. That's the biggest thing is you're, you know, I have this director comes, I have this great idea. I, I want this explosion. I want the plane to crash here, but I want it to explode this way. How much is that, you know, and they'll say, how much is that going to cost? And the producer will say, well, it's going to cost a lot. Do you have to see it explode or can we just see it start to descend into the ground and then later see a puff of, of, of smoke and just assume that we know that the plane crashed? Because that, that'll save us X amount of dollars. And the director's like, do I have a choice? The person says no. Okay, then okay, then we'll do that. So you'll see a lot of a lot of things you see on the screen. It was just a conversation between producer and director of what do we what can we show financially? What can we actually do? So. Well, and in animation, this actually sounds like you would need to know scope, uh, man hours, effort that you know might go into producing an effect with your engineering team. Exactly. You know, and then, and then basically, you know, you can calculate with number of man hours like what the you know what the yep. cost of that, you know, output is going to be and thinking about constraints yep. and scarcity and who, and do we have that kind of time? Do we have anyway? people to do it? Yeah, yeah. we can't, we're, we're resource constrained. We don't have any, you know, that remember that scene you wanted where he was underwater and, and so on. The whole team's working on that. So a lot of it is, would you rather have us with this underwater scene or would you rather care about the explosion of the airplane? Because based on what the story and where I think you're headed, I think you really care about this underwater scene. So it's a lot of that. I watched the uh, the post production. You know, I've got a three year old, so I watched the post production <laughs> credits of Moana and Coco. Great, and, love that movie. And uh, one of the things they pointed to in Moana that, that goes right to this point was when they, you know, throw their hair around, like when Moana's hair like oh. snaps around. That had apparently never been done before. Yeah. Uh, well, it, and so it, that was a huge like engineering lift to make that look realistic. Yeah, and that's one of the, one of the things that you mentioned about Pixar. And Disney, we're all under the Disney family, um, but Pixar is known for every film that you see, we have a new 
we have a new um, a, a software tool or to show off, right? In Moana, it was actually the hair, but the water in Moana was, was a big deal. They actually came to us and said, hey, what did you do with your water on Nemo? Like, we want to do that. And then they upped it and they were like, hey, now we got to do what Moana did for water. So it's, we have a, we actually do have an engineering team of about 120 people at Pixar who are responsible for our tools and our software that we use to animate and make effects. And we, they have a product owner or manager who comes to the films and says, all right, what do you, what's, what's our 2022 film? What's something you guys are looking to do differently? So we'll, you know, we'll go through the art pitch with them and say, and then they run back and like, well, what if we did this? Or what if we did that? So it, there is still software product managers at Pixar. And that is awesome. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's what a cool job. I mean, this just sounds like what a, what a fun role. I would love that. It, no, no, it's fun. Rochelle, um, let's imagine the Cal student athlete right now that's hearing this conversation and they just want in. They want in on what you're doing right now. Yeah. What do they need to do? What are the skills they need to develop, the steps they need to take to get where you are right now? Thank you for asking that because the, I'll be as honest as I can and as blunt as I can. And I have... Um, Two younger sisters that are that I'll use it as an example of this. But if you want to be in film, and that's that's which a lot of people do, right? It's it's glamorous, it's fun, it's famous, it's the red carpet, it's you name it, they have it. And I would say if you want to be in film, the point of these internships and production assistant jobs that you will typically start off in are not glamorous. And I really mean that they're not glamorous. It is not, it's it, it, glamorous in that your day-to-day -day tasks, you, you will be wanting to do so much more because you feel like you're capable of doing so much more. But they, it's almost intentional, if I feel like in the film industry, is because they're trying to weed out the people who really want to be there versus the people who think it's really cool to be there. So they kind of put you through a test, right? It's like starting as a freshman, we're gonna have you sit for a year before you can actually get into thinking <laughs> about getting some minutes, right? So apply, apply, apply. You will get no, you will get more no's than you get yes in the film industry. Guarantee it, hands down. The people who give up, and I know a lot of them, I have a lot of great friends who went on and did other things because they didn't get in on their first or two tries. And I'm like, I tried for, two times a year for seven years, 14 times, I'd probably then some, and finally got a yes, and finally got my opportunity. And I wouldn't regret it any other way. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably have done it any other way because I learned so much from product management and, and so on and so forth. But keep applying, and once you get in, because you will get in, if you keep applying and you show those recruiters or whoever it is that you want to work for that you're serious and you're still here after a couple of years, they notice that. Trust me, I had friends with HR people at Pixar and they noticed that. They, When I joined, some of them had said, oh, you're Rochelle, you're the one that's been trying for a really long time to get in. It's so great to see you finally here. And I was like, wow, great. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Keep applying. And once you're in, just know the first couple of years is a grind. And... But, it, but if you are passionate enough, which if you have gotten to the point of applying and getting in, you, you probably have that passion, you're going to learn so much and you're going to be able to observe so much because PAs bounce all over the place, interns bounce all over the place, and use that to your advantage to ask questions, take your notes, and learn, 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 because then when you get promoted and you get to that next spot, you're that much ahead of all the other interns or PAs who were just doing the day-to-day -day job and only doing the day-to-day -day job. So my two younger sisters, I just have to say, uh, same thing, they're, they're, they're film geeks, it's like film family. They finally got their chance. They're, they're you know, they're, they're PAs on a, a Lucasfilm project down in LA right now. And I'll have calls with them where they're just like, I had to find the cupcakes that the director liked today. And I had to go to eight different cupcake stores until I found the right flavor. <laughs> and I was like, that that's it. That's the PA life. You know, like you're, you're getting cupcakes for the director on his birthday and it has to be the right one. So, you know, I, I gave them the same advice, you know, they're in it and they're, they're like, gosh, and I'm like, it'll pass. You, you, you got to put your time in. They're trying to weed you out and then things will go from there. So it's kind of like uh, if you decide you want to major in biology or chemistry at Cal <laughs> and, you know, they make the, the, the TA classes, which are every day at like 7am. Right. <laughs> Same. Exactly. Same, same idea. Concept. 
you know, you <laughs> gotta just, you, you gotta, you gotta know how to absorb some pain. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's also, sounds like the other thing that's this good is if you have this focus, like particularly that you have where you, you know where you want to go and you have a sense of how, you know, there's a stairway to get there that uh, maybe you wouldn't be as, you know, emasculated as much as you might be, you know, doing something like getting um, cupcakes because you, you just know it's, it's a part of the system and it's a, it's a step, you know, moving in the right direction. Uh, so, wow. Put okay. your time, put the time in. <laughs> so since, since we were just talking about, you know, pain and dealing with pain and grit and like playing the long game, <clears throat> Now's the perfect time to shift to, you know, sort of a discussion about the intangible benefits of, you know, the tens of thousands of hours that you've invested as an athlete since you were, you know, probably like six running, <laughs> treating, competing, line drills, probably a lot of line drills for you, you know, a lot of running, <laughs> <laughs> all that, you know, like, uh, and so our audience, you know, clearly some of them were, are still at Cal are very interested whether the sensibilities that you developed as an athlete are, are transferable uh, to this particular post sports career of either as a producer or a PA and um, yep. or sorry, a, a producer, a product manager or a production assistant. And you know, for that, I'm yep. going to turn the mic over to Rob. Yeah, Rochelle, we hear a lot about the advantages embedded in the mindset of former athletes at work along with these other disciplines that supposedly give former athletes an edge in the workforce. Um, you've talked about this a bit, but can you elaborate? Do you think that's true? Do you think that's just hype? Um, and do you think that you have any basketball related superpowers kind of specific to your sport um, on your days in the court that are giving you an edge in your work at Pixar? Just blacken that line for us. Give us some tangible examples, maybe. Yeah. 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 There, there's there's two that come to mind that I that that are I think overlooked and and the first one is the concept of a schedule and I remember being a student athlete every minute of my day was scheduled and I remember thinking I don't have any free time I can't go hang out with my friends because I have x y and z to do and it seems like you're, it's very restrictive and it's in that you're kind of, you're, you're trapped a lot of the time as a student athlete. And it took me until a few years after graduating to realize the edge that that gave me when it came to how scheduled your days are as any of those jobs you just outlined. And the fact that my brain and body knew when something was done, what's next, right? And you can notice the people who didn't play a sport or do anything in group settings because they tend to kind of float or they'll be the ones that complain a lot about, God, I got to go to this meeting next or get emotionally drained. Like, that's a big thing. A lot of people can't handle critically thinking for that long because they just their brains have never done it. We are wired to cre to think like that from any sport, right? And that is so important. You'll notice it as soon as you leave that there, there is benefit to how structured your life was because it'll help you when you need to create structure, you know how to do it. Your brain's disciplined to follow that structure. So that's like number one, first and foremost, is like your brain is already 10 steps ahead of other people who've never had that. And conditioned, and essentially. You're conditioned, yeah. And, and then the second thing is you're conditioned for the most, for most sports, even even individualized sports, that you are relying on other people to do something, you have to, right? The the, I know I needed four other players on the court to do what we needed to do. A lot of people don't know that feeling, so they don't know how to ask for help. They don't even know when they need help, and they don't know how to give help. So when you're in meetings and somebody brings up something that needs to be done. The athletes tend to be the first person to think, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Or, yeah, oh, yeah, I, I can do that for you. Oh, I got that. Or the other way around, like they're the first ones to admit in a meeting, like, hey, guys, I need help. Like, I, 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 I'm stuck. I have this prioritization. I don't have time. Who can help me with this? The, the ability to give and ask for help because you relied so much on your teammates is another huge thing that you will see where you you are different than other people at work. And people, the, the so funny because your bosses will always – compliment you on things like you know you're just you're such a team player this and that and you think to yourself 
it's almost like being told when you're a kid, you're such a good team player because you're like, yeah, I know. But to other people, they don't hear that and they don't they don't get it. So for bosses, they're like, this is amazing. We have somebody here who wants to work with other people. We're going to you get all this glory like you've like you've done something so unique. And at the end of the day, you're like, it's not that big of a deal. So hold on to those two things is what I would tell people right now. I know you had another part of your question. No, you pretty much got it. And <laughs> another thing that's been coming up to my mind is um, there's been a lot of leadership themes coming up. And if I'm correct in my research, you were team captain your senior year when you played yeah. basketball, correct? Mm -hmm. And we, you talk about motivating people, relationships, asking people to get stuff done as a product manager and as a producer. Can you talk about your definition of leadership and how you see that playing out in your sports career versus your non-sports professional careers? Yeah. Being a true leader is more about your team's success than your own success. Bottom line, that's how I've always, always just to its core for me. And the, the moment that time shifts in your life when you realize that, and it may not be in college, it may not be your first couple of years out of college, but at some point it'll shift. You'll, you'll realize it. And when you do, you'll notice how much that skill can translate. I think you asked to the rest of your life of partnership with whoever, you know, your partner is, um, the role you play in your family, the role you play with your friendships. And because um, at any given point, you're always you always have a group of people that you're interacting with. And the moment you can put yourself aside for the better of the team. Great things will happen to you as a person. Um, yeah, I just, and, Rochelle, yeah. I just, I just read something that reads almost exactly like that. Again, I, I read a lot of Ben Horowitz because uh, he's a, <laughs> he's an awesome dude. But he, you know, he points out that um, he, when you're hiring for people, that that idea of like that that team focus rather than me focus, where you know the the, the perfect uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, outcome would be to have a group of people who achieve their own success through the company's success, yeah, exactly. essentially. Mm -hmm. And so that seems like, you know, the way you were just defining leadership. And I also liked the thing that the thing you were mentioning about your bosses. I know this was always really useful. You know, this idea of having kind of a workmanlike attitude, yeah. you know, you're, you're a part of a team, you know, you're not the only member of the team. And frankly, Robin, I always talk about, you can't do anything important in life by yourself. No, it takes exactly. a team. To, yeah. to do really big things that uh, are moonshots, things that are complicated, you know, that have that have really lasting impact. So I, yeah, man, that, that was a really really cool answer. Speaking from the heart, man, you know. <laughs> Is there anything? Else? Did I answer your other question? Which was, I think you had said. Well, I think you had said. What, was there an example of something that you did as a player with leadership that you can see yourself doing in the real world? One, one tangible thing you'd ask for? Yeah, one example? Yeah. I have one. You know, like because maybe one, one that's like was on the bench. You, you kind of said the basketball one where you like, you know, you, you're, you're relaying to your teammates. But yeah, something from basketball, something from Pixar. Yeah. The, the, okay. So when, when you're a captain on the court, most times when there's a dead ball or there's, um, you know, timeout, whatever it is, the team huddles. I don't know if you guys ever noticed basketball teams, they love to huddle. They talk about <laughs> what's happening and then they go, you know, line up on the foul line. And that, that practice of, we just, I can't breathe. I have four people looking to me to say something and react and say something in the moment, right? That think on your toes quickly, problem solve very quickly in your head. Like, Hey, switch on that screen next time because you're getting kicked, you're getting killed and they're going to shoot threes over you all day. That right there translates to meetings when you're put on the spot or when somebody asks you to say something that alone was like, Oh, I know how to do this. Like you, you can think quickly on your toes because you had to do it when you're on the court. And, and mm -hmm. so that was just one other thing I wanted to, to bring up of, something that's easily, that was easily transferable. So, uh, so, <laughs> so clear. Wonderful. <clears throat> so, um, now we're sort of moving toward the, uh, our, our final question here, which is, uh, and that you'll, you'll recognize this 
this theme from our from our board discussions. So 98% of the student athletes at Cal go pro in something other than their sport right when they graduate. And then the other 2% ultimately go pro in something other than their sport after a pro career, which some people think is even, you know, harder. Yeah. And we've, we've heard poignantly from uh, uh, all the people in our orbit that we, all of our sort of user constituents, that that transition from being uh, a student athlete, from having an athlete's identity to sort of the post sports you identity you know, at, to begin with, unknown is really, really hard. It can be, you know, people have described feeling untethered, you know, deeply uncertain about who they'll become, how life will yeah. unfold, what the first steps are that they should take, how to navigate all this. So, you know, if, you know, as you're 30 something, you, what would you, I mean, if you were going to give some guidance or, you know, uh, some career advice or both to your 20, two-year-old you like what would you what would you say (laughs) you know seek help you can't do it alone and um that's the point when you're the I felt the most vulnerable in my life of exactly what you said those feelings are all very real and I didn't seek the help that I needed and help can come in a lot of different ways, but I, I, am a big fan of therapy. I'm a big fan of life coaches. I'm a big fan of meditation. And I wish I would have had, I, I do those in my later, you know, late twenties, early thirties. And I wish I could have had that when I had just graduated because we can't do it alone. The feelings you feel are real and nothing you can do by yourself is going to fix it. I mean, quite honestly, that's the time when you have to reach out for help. And, and, and tell people how you're feeling, find some guidance, find something that motivates you again, because it, it will come, something will spark you, but you, it, I just think you need help with that. So um, that's probably yeah. more, not a pull yourself up by your own bootstraps kind of mentality, but more of a outreach I think, mentality. Hey, that sounds like very practical advice. I'll give you a couple of reasons why I think so. Like one, it, I think it takes confidence to, uh, to say that like you don't know everything. And somehow I think, you know, when you're younger, people think that somehow they should know everything or, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, where it's like, you know, how, how impossible is that? <laughs> I mean, like if you're not constantly learning throughout your entire life, you know, looking for people that are smarter than you looking for, you know, help from everyone, as you say, from, from therapists to mentors to, you know, your, your fellow, your fellow man, your fellow woman who's working, you know, you're, you're, you're yeah. not going to get there. That's an important like uh, skill, and I, I also wanted to draw back. One of my uh, uh, mentors was a fellow named Hooks Johnston. Uh, you know, really accomplished guy. Went to Brown, Harvard Business School, all these things. You know, he turned into a venture capitalist, and he he pointed out that uh, with the the CEOs that were in his portfolio companies, by far the best uh, method for transferring information was you know some form of mentorship. It was much faster. Uh, it was much more, you know, than, than say like books or going to business school. It was, uh, you know, the information was all highly concentrated. It was like wisdom that had been distilled over lots and lots of years. Yeah. And so they made, they made a concerted effort inside the portfolio to, to make sure right. that their, their early stage, you know, you know, startup company CEOs got access to as many people as possible. Even if yeah. they weren't looking for it, they forced it on them. That's how important yeah. it was. Yeah. So I think I think your guidance could not be better, and you know, that's uh, so I, I think I think it's sublimely important. Well done. Yeah. I have to give a, a shout out to Steve Edder. I think a lot of people know who he is uh, in our in our community, and um, he was he was my mentor. I, I I'd see him maybe every three or four months, and stop by and have coffee with him, and just everything from from as soon as I as soon as I graduated up until I got into Pixar, which reminds me I need to reach out to him. Um, but he was he was a, a somebody that I reached out to for help. So I would feel like an idiot if I didn't even bring that up. And I hope you're listening, Steve. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's it's funny that you mentioned Steve, who, by the way, is an honorary member of the Big C Society, yep. and he's he's also a mentor to me. Uh, an anonymous uh, person 
donated about half of the operating budget for this particular podcast series. Mm. And we just want to say thank you to that anonymous person. Thank you, anonymous person. On this episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Rochelle, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much yeah. for spending this time with us. Uh, you're 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 an awesome golden bear. We, I can't wait to see your first movie. It's going to be awesome. And uh, yeah, just really thank you for everything. No, of course. Thank you. This is this has been so much fun. Thanks for letting me relive all this those memories with you guys. And uh, this is yeah, this was a lot of fun. So thank you. Go Bears. Go Bears. Go Bears. Go Bears.